so welcome back to the midday edition of Time Out with the Sports Doctor podcast. Uh, we have another very special guest with us today, uh, Dr. Rachel Gainsbrew. Uh, she is a clinical pharmacist, but the most important part that we're going to talk about today is how she's pivoted uh, to become a real, a real estate investor, especially in the short term uh, rental state, real estate uh, area. So welcome to the show. Very glad to have you here. And thank you for making time in your very busy schedule to come on. Are you interested in real estate? Are you tired of hearing about all the money that your friends and colleagues are making from their investments, but you don't know where to start? Don't worry, I got you. We are teaming up with Dr. Ronnie Shalev and Shawin Properties to equip you with the tools you need to feel empowered about your investments. So how do you get involved? Do these three things. First, go to my website at drderekthesportsdoctor.com and click on the sponsor link for Shawin Properties. This will give you access to a free webinar as well as the ability to have a discovery call with Dr. Rani Shalev. Also follow her on social media and stay tuned for more helpful tips coming at you on Money Mondays. Now back to the episode. Dr. Burgess, thank you so much for having me. And thank you for taking the time out to put this content together. I know you have a busy schedule as well, but the information yeah. that you're sharing with the community is so valuable. So I appreciate you carving out that time to share with us. Absolutely. And I think the, the most important thing I've learned about podcasting is being able to connect with people like you. Um, you know, I've learned about you by listening to one of my previous guests podcast. Uh, Lisa Hilton. So I listened to the podcast. I immediately reached out to her and said, hey, I need an introduction. And within <laughs> minutes, Lisa, I was like, wow, that was quick. Within minutes, she had shot out an email to your team and here we are. So, but that's how it works. And that's how uh, relationship capital that I talk about a lot on this podcast. That's exactly how it works. And that's something that, you know, if I wasn't in this podcast realm or wasn't listening to podcasts, how would I come across the work that you're doing? So yeah, that's true. Uh, we know. probably wouldn't have met. You're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, tell us about, I saw that you're from Haiti, yes. uh, first generation Haitian uh, American. So tell us how uh, your family, did they kind of guide you towards a career in medicine or what led you into uh, becoming a pharmacist? Yeah, absolutely. And so one thing that you'll learn about uh, traditional Haitian culture uh, and I know it has changed <laughs> with uh, updates and the latest and greatest, but traditionally it's all about having a solid, safe career. And if you're not a doctor, then you're an attorney. Those are your, your two options, pretty much. Uh, nurse is also on the table, but that's it. Nothing else really is recognized in uh, in our culture. And as a matter of fact, my parents knew that I have transitioned to full-time real estate. They'd be wondering like, what is that? Are you a real estate agent? What even is that? You yeah. know, but had I worked, you know, 14 hour shifts on my feed, being a pharmacist, burnt out, stressed out to them, that is the epitome of you're doing it yeah. the golden child you're doing it yeah. nothing yeah. else nothing else they don't care about the revenue or anything it's that status and so I all, all along the way I was taught two things that which I'm grateful for you know having a good work ethic education uh and faith you know and so very much faith-based um household and education household uh these were really the pillars of my upbringing and I, and I'm still oh so very grateful for it but as we know there are cycles and as you gain more information you get smarter and you want to work uh smarter not harder mm -hmm. <laughs> you can then leverage other opportunities Absolutely. So how long into your pharmacy career did you get started with being an entrepreneur? Is that something that you always were involved with? Yeah, that's a great question. No, I was always intrigued with it. I think about the young man who sold 
candy bars out of his backpack at school thinking that was weird and I look back now I'm like he was on to something (laughs) (laughs) he was generating his own revenue streams that way but uh no actually we were taught not to work outside of you know school just focus on school that was our work you know that was your full-time job was to focus on school and again there's a lot of merit to that right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I was so grateful for it I excelled in school got the doctorate hooray but wait a minute, uh, walked away with half a million dollars in student loans. And so my husband and I, we worked our fingers to a bone. At, at one point we had moonlight shifts, like five jobs between the two of us to pay off those student loans. And going through that process was so eye-opening. You mentioned podcasts a little bit earlier, my drives to work in between in the med um, room. I was listening to podcasts and I was consuming a considerable amount of real estate podcasts because Mm -hmm. I knew on the other side of these student loans, I wanted to figure out a way of not doing that again or that for the next 20 years of my life. I had to figure out a way to not make my, you know, exchange all of my hours for dollars. And Mm -hmm. so that's when I started to open my eyes to what entrepreneurship uh, and real estate investing and passive income, all of that could afford me. So 500K, that's only your student loans or is that yours plus your husband? It was a combination of both of ours, but the majority was mine. (laughs) Sure, sure, understood. Yeah, so, you know, student loans, that's something that, most of the time when you're going through training, I'll speak for myself, never did I think about, let me start paying off student loans. It was, okay, I get this check, good, I can spend it, right? Yeah. And I'll spend it on vacations, I'll spend it on rent, I'll spend it on clothes, I'll spend it on a, a, a nice wedding. weekend out. Right, a <laughs> wedding, right. Yeah, let's invest in our wedding, right? <laughs> so, but you go to these kind of financial counseling at the beginning of the year and you sign, yes, I want my student loans. I want to max out my student loans. No. But were you really educated about student loans? I never felt that I knew, no. even no. as a resident that, you know, if I had just started making, I had one co-resident who was making, um, and probably because she was a, a woman and she was smarter than us, but she started <laughs> making minimum payments and she paid off her student loans a lot quicker than everybody else. And I realized once I got out and I looked five years down the road and I've been paying and it hasn't bulged because it had accrued so much interest over the years that I was just getting back down to my baseline. So what did you kind of think about your student loans and kind of education that you received around it? Yeah, one thing that I'm going to be honest, and I've never said this in public before, but I would get those alumni notifications from my university and I would it would burn my biscuit. Like Mm -hmm. you want me as an alumni to donate to a cause and I am drowning in these student loans. Are you kidding me right now? And I hate Mm -hmm. to sound Mm -hmm. that way. No, I get it. It burnt my biscuit because I I felt victim and, you know, I know Mm -hmm. now that I'm not, but I felt victim to the student loan crisis. I didn't know what I was signing up for. And financial literacy, although education was really big in my household, financial literacy was not part of the um, conversations. We didn't have the finances to literate upon, right? Right. No, I get it. We grew up quite poor, you know, in the inner city of Miami. My dad from Haiti and my mom from Haiti, they were very, you know, well to do, but we came to the States, the language barrier, they had to start from scratch and work because by at that point there was three, four of us, you know? And so they focused on investing all of their time and work just to make ends meet. And so I had zero financial literacy um, information. As a matter of fact, in school, I was told, you know what, you're going to be making all this money. (laughs) And that gave me this false sense of, you know, um, wellness worry about, financially. Yeah. Yeah. worry about it later yeah worry about it later and it's my husband my husband actually was raised in a different household where there were he had affluence he had seen affluence and he got it he's not he's more of a um you know left brain like our like artsy and mm-hmm. he's a psychotherapist mm-hmm. and he's all into that but i he was trusting me with the numbers I know numbers, (laughs) 
but not finance it, but he got it immediately. And so when we came out of school, I'm here at the um, Range Rover boutique naturally, right? And I'm here at, you know, meeting with the builder to build the six bedroom home, like the two of us with one kid, six bedroom home, of course we need that. <laughs> yeah. I'm here signing up for private school because only the best, right? And he's like, where is all this money coming from? Like they said, we're going to be making a lot of money, but we have student loans. And it's until I actually sat down and give me a spreadsheet on any, on everything and looked at the numbers. I was like, wait a minute, you know? And so he had already seen it. <laughs> he saw the writing on the wall. He goes, Rage, I don't think are you sure the numbers are going to pan out this way? I don't think they are. And so he got it, but I there, there was no financial literacy at all. And so I'm super, super passionate about that now. As a matter of fact, I am going back to my alma mater to speak about financial literacy. Not that I've pegged myself as the, you know, the guru on it by any means, but we were able to pay down our student loans. We sold everything. We sold the house. We went down from a I want to say 5,000 square foot home down to a 1,300 square foot wow. apartment. And we sold everything. We paid off everything in just a sh few short years. And then we went into real estate investing because he just wasn't having it. Had he been my same personality, we probably would have been drowning <laughs> still yeah, to this no. day. He was like, no. <laughs> yeah. That's glad that you had somebody that was different, but you know, I can relate with everything you said. Never in a million years I think that you can make a six-figure salary and spend all of it, you know, in a year. You think that, okay, I'm gonna make X amount of dollars, I'm gonna be able to save a lot. But if yeah. you don't adjust your lifestyle and you just start to live lavishly, like you mentioned, sometimes. big house, big yeah. car, trips, food, yeah. eating out all the time, that money all is gone. Time. And you'll still live paycheck to paycheck and you're still dependent on your job. Yeah. Um, so and that's why I think the mindset piece is so important uh, to go from being just, you know, I talked about Robert Kiyosaki a lot to being a worker to being an investor, you know, moving from that left side to the right side of quadrant. And it's so important because if not, you just get caught up in the rat race. You have yeah. to work more and just to sustain your lifestyle. Forget about even creating wealth for your family. So that's why I want to pivot because you come up on a gym so tell us about <laughs> you know real estate and then specifically yeah. more kind of the short-term real estate that you're doing and your approach to it yeah so towards the tail end of that we we're in that apartment and we were thinking to ourselves wow we've made a lot of headway and we were using the system a debt snowball system and that just really um, catapulted our ability to get rid of the student loans and we actually were looking at okay what is our next step we wanted to purchase a home for ourselves and we wanted to invest because we were quite burnt out from that, um, <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, from that process. Beans and rice, rice and beans. <laughs> beans, and, you already know, yes. But I kind of like beans and rice and rice and beans because I'm Haitian. <laughs> so to me, that was just the truth. It wasn't punishment. Huh? Okay. It wasn't punishment. I was like, yes. <laughs> I can get behind that. But we wanted to invest. Um, in real estate, we looked at different investment strategies or Bitcoin was coming out at the time. We're like, what is this? Well, we couldn't quite figure it out. And we really believed that we wanted to invest in something that we understood and I can touch a house. I can feel a house. So we went for real estate, but within real estate, there are so many different factors and there are so many different um, avenues with which you can invest. So we looked at uh, what was the easiest and best way in time saving and wouldn't cost any money to get in was wholesaling. Mm -hmm. Woohoo, let's use wholesaling, right? Well, quickly, you know, when we did a deeper research, we realized, hey, this is a whole other job, like legit, a whole other full time job that you require, you would require staff and all of that to make that really work and profitable. And so we kind of kicked that to the curb. Then we looked at, um, Obviously, the next best step, which is going to be um, from HDTV Fix and Flip, right? You see everyone at the end of the episode, 40K, easy. Right. <laughs> every, easy. every dollar they put into renovation <laughs> turns into a dollar uh, in their, their sale price. It's amazing how that works. Right. 
<laughs> so again, did our research and you realize that's a whole project management job. So it's a whole other job that we didn't necessarily um, think we would enjoy doing or want to do. And so we just kept looking around long-term rentals. We found some rentals in Georgia. It was like one that was 20 doors only $300,000. We're like, oh, we're going for it. But when we looked at the rent roll, they were paying $160 a month. And I said, you know what? I want to live there. Right. <laughs> My son, you probably don't want to live there. Right. <laughs> but- but, you know, I was like, okay, so where's my ROI? I don't even think it met the 2% rule at that point or the 1% rule rather. So then I um, I just kept looking and I saw syndications and I looked at some of those um, balance sheets and I was like, you know what, that's not going to, the ROI wasn't there for some of the opportunities that came uh, across my desk. And finally, I saw short-term rentals, you know? And so for me, short-term rentals was a win-win because I always had an eye for design. Or so I thought my designers don't think I do, but I think I have an eye for design. <laughs> no, they're sweet. And I thought it would be something that I would enjoy doing. Um, and, and it turns out that I do. And so I started with my first short-term rental. I found a home in a market that I'm very familiar with, literally 0.1 miles away from where I lived in my own backyard, underpriced, it needed a new roof, uh, understood what that would cost and understanding what capital expenditures are, are so important because when you walk into any deal and especially as a your first investment, Uh, property, you hear your dad in your mind telling you, oh, if the electrical's, you know, not working, Mm -hmm. walk away. Mm -hmm. If the roof's not working, walk away. But as an investor, you put on a different hat, right? So, well, how much does it cost? Does the deal still make sense? And if it still makes sense, you can move forward. And so knowing that this property was priced way under market value, the homeowner unfortunately had passed away due to old age. And the trustee was out of state and they didn't know too much about the market. They just went ahead and listed it. And so we snatched it up and we turned that into our first luxury short-term rental. We set it up, designed it as a short-term rental. And uh, that home was priced at 290,000 or so. We purchased it at that price. We asked for nothing, no contingencies, nothing. And so we won in the face of like seven or, or eight other bids. And we put in, I want to say about $12,000 worth of work into it. And we were able to rent it out for about six to 7,000 a month. Um, Wow. Yeah, which was fantastic. And um, we thought, oh my goodness, let's do this again and rinse and repeat. And we purchased a second home, uh, not too far from there, but a larger home. And that home, I was thinking to myself, okay, I can probably make eight or 9,000 on it. And um, this one was much more expensive. It was 460,000. And so once I put in my systems, added the dynamic pricing tool to that property, that home really was an aha moment for me. I was anticipating eight or 9,000 for this home. The this dynamic single family, price, single yeah. family home. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just based on the, um, the bedroom count. Uh, mm-hmm. was larger than the previous home and based on the history of the previous home. Okay. I figured, you know, 9,000, dare I imagine 10,000? I said, no, I can't even go there. I turned on the dynamic pricing tool, which is an algorithm based um, tool that looks at the metrics for the entire market. This particular home got priced by the database for the next 30 nights for $28,000. And I said to myself, okay, no, there's no way (laughs) that this is correct. And so um, before I got the opportunity to turn it off to retrain it, it got booked. That property got booked at 28K. The Sabre training bat is like no other training bat you've ever used before. So the purpose of the Sabre training bat with its modified barrel is so that you can perfectly sequence and get behind the ball, getting the bat on plane sooner, creating less miss hits, more line drives, higher batting averages, and more exit velocity. The Sabre training bat is the number one training bat on the market. Sabre bats, the training bat that's gonna take you to your best swing. What location is this? 
This isn't a suburban area in Georgia. Okay. South so of we're not Atlanta. talking South Beach, right? <laughs> no, there's no water. There's no beach. There are no mountains. There are no lakes. Yeah. Wow. So okay. the guest that book for that amount was actually the executive director of a um, a movie series that um, is being filmed in Georgia. And then the following month, it got booked for 21000 by uh, a property uh, homeowner's insurance company who had a family who was displaced. And then the next month, it was 15000 then 22000 And so at what point do you ask yourself, like, what am I playing too small, <laughs> right? You know, for me, 10000 was like, I, I wouldn't even dare. Like, knowing me, I'm not paying 10000 yeah. Like, I can't yeah, afford that's crazy. me. I'm yeah. not paying 10,000, you know, but you just never know the type of value that you can curate for the right buyer. You know, that's the key. The right buyer may be out there for the value that you're able to curate. So I remember that night at 28,000, I was like, oh, I'm going to turn this off. You have to train it. They book. Mm -hmm. I, I had to take a step back. It's like, where else am I playing small in my life? Where else? Because it's just unbelievable, you know? So the algorithm did not have any preconceived notions. It did not have any hangups. It didn't have any history of money trauma, right, <laughs> you know? Right. It understood the scarcity in the area. It understood the value that this property had as it relates to other properties. It understood the lack of availability of other properties. And so it priced it based on that. And so- to me, I, I still can't get over. And that's the property. I don't know if you got to see that um, was featured on Netflix just last month on Buy My House. So really excited gotcha. about that. So you just kind of glazed over that. You were on Netflix, Buy My House, your home in Atlanta, <laughs> right outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. So give everybody the, uh, the episode. Do you know the episode number? Yeah, or? yeah. So it's episode number four, right around the eight minute mark you'll get to see that house that I'm talking about right now. Nice, nice. So I think for anyone that was about to click off this episode, I think they're intrigued now. So <laughs> first tell us what defines a luxury rental um, and you know what kind of market is that that you typically target for a luxury rental? What's great about modern luxury, Dr. Burgess, as it compares to traditional luxury, modern luxury is not our grandmother's luxury, right? We're not lifestyles of, rich, of the rich and famous. Do you remember that right. show with the gold yeah, doorknob, <laughs> the gold yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Just overstimulation of things. Modern luxury is actually cleaner. You know, and when it comes to modern luxury travel, it is the accumulation of experiences that guest wants a unique experience. Okay. And I call it my three C's of modern luxury travel. It's the guest communication. So communication is the key. So how you set up your listings, what you say in your listings, how you almost story tell, you tell them what they're going to be able to experience. You know, you don't say it's a living room in the caption, living room. Duh. I see it's a <laughs> living room, right? It's like lounge on this such and such sofa as you enjoy, you know? So when it comes to luxury, you have so much opportunity and just the world is your oyster when it comes to luxury. The second C of luxury travel is connections. If you can curate a way for your guests to connect with nature, as well as connect with those who are with them, that is definitely the vibe they're looking for. You know, the outdoor area, if you can create a fire pit, it depends on the market, right? Not all markets are created equal, right. but think about how do we re help them to reconnect with each other? How do we help them to reconnect with nature, the connections? And number three, it's convenience. If you can make life easy for them, don't make them work hard to check into the door. If they can't put in a code to just go into the door, it's over, right? So no when keys, comes, no, no turn key keys. Like, no, I'm not fighting for my life. It's the middle of the night. Some of them are coming in late at night. Now they have to get a flashlight to look for a lockbox of where it is convenient, make it easy for them. So when it comes to luxury, those are really the three pillars for me. Um, they want to connect with nature. They want to connect with the community. They want to live like a local. They want those unique experiences. Something as simple as 
um, a local recipe. We we're talking about Louisiana real quick, right? Is there a mm -hmm. famous gumbo recipe that you can add the dry goods next to a crock pot, just add water, and they have a local recipe that they can, you know, enjoy to connect somehow. That's what we can do as hosts. Unfortunately, the hotels, they can't necessarily do that all the time, but we as hosts, we are uniquely positioned to do so. So that's why we have been able to thrive in Pennsylvania, the mountains of the Poconos, mm -hmm. and in our backyard in Atlanta. We are looking for ways to make these things happen. And outside of that, if we want to talk about tactical and tangible in your audience, probably, Rachel, give me the things to buy and stop like <laughs> typicating. King size luxury bed is a default travel luxury bed. You want to add a king size luxury bed somewhere in your property. We're actually building a house on a beach. We have five bedrooms. Four of them are going to be king size bed. Nice. Okay. That's because that screams you know, bring other couples, right? That's how we travel. Yes. It's me, my spouse, his siblings, their spouses, their um, kids, when we travel and our parents, aging parents, when we travel, it's about four or five of us splitting the bill. And you have to think of that because we, our nightly rates are quite high, but once they split it, they each have a great king size bed and ensuite, you know, we're building the house specifically for our avatar. And then a, a crazy bunk room, just like lots of built-in bunks, just really, really awesome. But that king size luxury bed, once it's split, you don't feel a certain kind of way about charging $1,800, 2000 a night, because that's what we charge, but you're splitting it between five paying units. Not mm -hmm. too bad because we do like the larger homes. That's where we get our biggest ROI. But um, yeah, so default travel bed is the king size bed. And when you were looking at homes that are outside of vacation areas and neighborhoods, we want there to be some kind of a curb appeal. So if we're like driving down my neighborhood where I grew up in Miami, in the hood, and you see the car on the lawn and you see people coming out, that is, <laughs> there's no way to market that as luxury. Just, okay, yeah. let me tell you what's not luxury. No <laughs> parking in the front that. yard, okay. okay. Right, <laughs> but if, you know, it's, you know, we have a lot of foliage and it's pretty well maintained, you can turn that um, property into a luxury stay by following some key metrics. I actually have an article published in Bigger Pockets, the 15 luxury amenities that won't break the bank. And part of that is, um, you know, just looking at, you know, what that curb appeal looks like, because that would completely exclude you from being a luxury stay, but everything else can really be worked on. To getting there you didn't hear her say an article in bigger pockets right <laughs> she's a big deal guys <laughs> she's a big deal folks all right so location you want to have a king size bed <laughs> and you want to have some curb appeal perfect yeah. all right well thank you and how many times have you been able to replicate this let people know that this is not just something that you know you hit a home run one time yeah. So thank you for asking that question because it's not an isolated incident. We've been able to replicate this 15 times, but what I'm most proud of and I'm so excited about is members in our, of our community are replicating this as well. So over 50 um, doctors and other busy medical professionals in our community have launched their properties as well in different markets and they're able to replicate the same process. So it's not an isolated incident at all. Yeah. So are you doing small group coaching or are you doing one on one coaching or how do people learn from you? Yeah. So I do have a hybrid. It's a small group one on one mentorship program. So we do have quite a few um, sessions where we do come together as a group and then there's a one on one component to that as well. And how can people find out more about that? Well, you know what, if you go to shorttermgems.com. And I'll send you that link, Dr. Burgess, but okay. shorttermgems.com, you'll get some information on how to get on a call with us. All right, perfect. So on Time Out with the Sports Doctor, this is your final time out. So you've given us a lot of great pearls and gems, and I'm sure a lot of people are sitting home like, man, let's do this. But at the same time, as soon as you say, let's do this, your brain's automatically going to say, you can't do that, right? Mm -hmm. So speak to that person who's sitting there saying, this all sounds great for Dr. You know, Gainsborough and for Dr. Burgess, but how do I do this myself? Yeah, so I would really, really encourage your community to take advantage of now. 
you know, now is the time. And you sometimes have to just start by starting. I know that a lot of us, we keep getting ready to start. We just need to start, move forward, because believe it or not, we have some amazing legislation right now uh, for cost segregation studies, bonus depreciation that are applicable for short-term rentals that are going to go away in a few years. You know, we're able to accelerate depreciation, see anywhere from 80 to 200% gross ROI on our initial investment. It goes down to 80% in 2023, and then 60% in 2024, but this year we're able to accelerate depreciation. So a lot of you who are on the fence thinking about, um, excel, you know, the fact that, um, the recession, you know, appears to have accelerated, the interest rates are higher, but you're Mm -hmm. still able to take advantage of a lot of these tax uh, benefits. And I hate to call it a loophole, but yeah, it's a short-term rental tax loophole. You're able to take advantage of that right now. And that trumps quite a bit of some of those negative, you know, reports that we're getting. So now is the time to invest, you know, you Warren Buffett says that if you don't find a way to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. So yeah. let's get to it. Let's get to it. And, and there's so much out there and we have a very supportive community as well. So if you want to do it, you can in fact do it. Perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you for sharing that, especially you're talking about that's before the end of 22 with the bonus depreciation for the short-term rentals. And that's specifically for short-term rentals, correct? Yeah. For short-term rentals, you get a hundred percent bonus depreciation if you can materially participate. And so material participation, it's easy to get that done before the end of the year because we're towards the end. And so ordering mm-hmm. furniture that's materially participating, and I'm not a tax advisor or anything, but I can right. just speak to it at a higher level. But if you jot down those hours where even you're researching property, that's considered material participation as well. And so you can get your 100 hours of material participation uh, to qualify for that 100 percent uh bonus depreciation we can accelerate that this year and next year it's 80 percent, and then the following is 60 percent until it phases out perfect thank you for that jim and how can people follow you on social media short.term.gems is one way you can find me on instagram but i do have a resource i know a lot of people ask what location to get started with um, investing, if you go to 75gems.com, that's the number 75gems.com, uh, that's going to give you my list of the top 75 US cities with the highest profitability for short term rentals. So it's a spreadsheet. I have a little training there, and it'll also send you to all of my social media links as well. All right. Well, thank you. So we all have homework. We have what, uh, 57, eight days now <laughs> to get it done. So get it done, please. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing all this with the community. And I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Such an honor. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for continuing to support this podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, then please leave a five-star review. And if you haven't done so, subscribe so you continue to get the updated episode. Until later, peace.